Greetings, retro friends. Today we're going to talk about memory. We're finally going to add some memory to the 9900 CPU. So let's take a look at the data sheet first. So what are these things? They are 32K by 8 SRAM. So SRAM means it's static, it's not dynamic. It means that the circuitry is a lot easier to handle, except it does take more power. So because these are 32K by 8, what I need is 32K by 16. I'm trying hard not to touch these because they are CMOS. But my mat is grounded, so hopefully nothing's gonna, nothing bad is going to happen to them. Anyway, um, these are 32K by 8 each, so if I put 1, 2 side by side, that would be 32K by 16. And remember that the address space in 16-bit words of the 9900 is 32K. Um, so we can see that it has an access time of 70 nanoseconds. That means that when you present an address on the address lines, then 70 nanoseconds later at most, uh, the data will appear on the output. Let me show you first a picture of the front panel that I want to put together. So here is my idea of the memory section of the front panel. So this thing over here is the run step. Uh, button. The idea is that you're not going to be able to fiddle with memory unless you're in the stop position because obviously if you're running uh, the CPU is the thing that's accessing memory not you. So you would have to stop it and then you could use the memory side to read and write data. The idea is that we have two rows of two position switches. These aren't um, toggle switches. Um, well they are they're on off switches basically. The address lines go from 15 to one and the data lines go from 15 to zero. And of course the reason that the address lines go from 15 to one is that in the 9900 CPU, it doesn't actually have a least significant bit at zero. That is the reason why you have 32K words, uh, but in byte oriented terminology, it would be 64K. So we leave off this last address. Addresses are always even in the 9900 CPU. We have a display of address and data. These are our nice little hexadecimal displays over here. And we also have two uh, push switches. These are these, uh, these switches where you can push them and it springs back to the uh, initial position. This switch, which I don't have a cap on, is one position, one position. So that's going to be used to enter in bits. Um, anyway, so this one is read and write or pre-increment read and pre-increment write. Okay, so you enter uh, an address on the address switches and then you press read. And what will happen is the address will appear here and the data is read from the RAM and it appears in the data window. When you want to write to memory, you flip the switches for the address, flip the switches for the data, flip write, and the address and data that you've just written appear in the windows. Um, a lot of uh, front panels from the uh, late 70s and early 80s have this other switch which will automatically increment the address for you uh, from a starting position. So the idea is that you can set up an address and flip read and it will show you what's in that address and then if you flip plus plus read what that does is it increments the address and then reads the data and shows you that so that way you can just flip through memory by going plus 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 and so on same thing with write um, you set up your address and data over here and you flip write the address and data appear over here and then you can set up the data and just go plus plus write and that will write the data to the next address, and then that will appear over here. Uh, or for example, if you wanted to uh, load up a bunch of zeros, for example, or a bunch of Fs, uh, you could just set up the address, set up the data, flip right, and then flip plus plus right, and flip it several times in order to uh, load that data into the address. And always the last written or read address is going to be displayed uh, in the address window. And that's basically it. So. Uh, how do you think we're going to implement this? Yeah, I have a state machine. So first let me talk about the circuitry uh, that I want to build. We have uh, this front panel data and front panel address, and these are these switches. 
Uh, they each have 16 lines. Well, actually the address only has 15 lines, but one of the lines is permanently connected to zero, basically. Uh, and we have the RAM on this side. So this is 32K by 16. Uh, now the RAM has data and it has address lines. It also has an output enable line, uh, which turns on and off the output data, and a write enable line, which allows you to write into the RAM. And we'll talk about how that works in a moment. Uh, but first, what I want to do is talk about the buffers. So these are tri-state buffers, and the idea behind tri-state buffers is that when they're off, they're effectively electrically disconnected from whatever their output is. If we disable this buffer over here, then effectively this data line has nothing feeding it in this direction. This over here is the 8-bit register that we used before. This is a 574. It's more convenient than other 8-bit registers because it has what's called a bus-oriented pinout, which means that all the data lines are on one side and all the output lines are on another. So that's why I like the 574. There would actually be two of them because they're 8 bits each. Uh, and they feed the uh, data display. So the idea is that if we were to present an address to the RAM and output enable were enabled, then the RAM would feed uh, the data out this way. And then you can clock the data in to this register and it would be displayed in the data window. Same thing with the address. If you want to feed an address to the RAM, you have to turn on this buffer over here, and that will directly feed the output of the switches to the address lines on the RAM. So you can see that that's kind of how we can implement the read uh, switch. So you would set up the address lines, you would turn on this buffer, and then when you flip the read switch, that basically clocks the data into the data uh, register. We also have an address register over here which is capable of incrementing the address. So you would also clock the data into this register and then um, that would enable the uh, address to appear in the address window. So that's the address window, that's the data window, great. So that's how read would work. In order to write data, of course, we have to feed the switches over to the RAM. So you would turn on this buffer. But the danger is that you cannot have the RAM outputting data at the same time as you're outputting data on the bus because you will get bus contention. So you have to be sure that only one device is talking at once. So that's why the output enable line is there so that you can turn off the output and that puts the RAM effectively into not talking mode. Um, so the only thing that's talking would be this buffer. You set up your address on your data, you turn the output off on the RAM, you turn these buffers on, that allows the address and data to get to the RAM, and then you pulse the write enable line and that writes the data into the RAM. The pre-increment modes basically um, clock is actually a counter register. Initially, when you read or write, that clocks the initial data into the address register. But then when you do plus plus read and plus plus write, you're not paying attention to the switches, so you're turning this buffer off. You're just clocking um, an increment uh, into this register. And then you need to turn this buffer over here on, because now you're feeding the output of that result to the RAM. Uh, so that basically, very briefly, is how the circuitry works. Um, again, like I said before, these registers over here are 574s. Um, you can't buy any of this stuff on like DigiKey, so you have to look on eBay for these. Um, 574s. The buffers are 541s. Um, you can get 8-bit buffers in the lower numbers, um, which you can probably get in DigiKey, but I like the 541s because, again, they have a bus-oriented pinout, which will make laying out the, the circuitry very easy. Uh, 541s are 8-bit buffers, 8-bit tri-state buffers, so of course I need two of them here, two of them here, and two of them over here. And then finally, this thing over here is, uh, it is an 8-bit binary up-down counter with preset. Uh, it's a 269, so with preset basically means that you can clock input data into the, uh, the counter. And 
uh, it's bidirectional, so you could actually count up or down. So if I wanted to, I, I suppose I could add also a pre-decrement uh, read and write switch if I wanted to. And that's basically all it is. So one, two, three, four, five, six of these chips, uh, seven, eight, um, nine, ten, of course, because you need this to be 16-bit. So that's 10, and then uh, I'm not counting the RAM. This is just going to be the, the front circuitry. So that's about 10 chips right there. Now I've already talked about how to read and write from the RAM, so link down below for that. Okay, you may notice a different sound quality because I've switched to another microphone. Anyway, so here I've redrawn the circuit with all of its signals, and let's uh, draw out what we want to see for reading so that we can start designing the state machine. So first of all, we know that we have a read switch. So here's read. We know that we want it to go up, and then we want to go down again, and that's when we actually start the read. So when we turn on the read, we want to send the front panel address over to the RAM address. So we want FP or AFP to bus, that's this signal, to be enabled. And let's see, what also do we want? Um, we want to clock that address into the address register. So that means that the address clock is going to go high. Now because this is a positive or edge triggered signal, we want to make sure that the address is actually on the bus before we clock it in. So we have to add a little bit of delay. So that will be one state. Um, and let's see, we also want the address load signal, of course, to go high at that point. And when we drop the clock, we can drop the address load signal. Now, uh, once we put the address onto the address lines, we know that the RAM, about 70 nanoseconds later, um, which is definitely uh, less than one clock cycle that we're going to use, uh, we know that uh, the data lines are going to go active. So what we want to do is we want to send that data down into the data register. So we have the data clock. And let's see, it's probably going to be here. The data clock, again, is edge triggered. So this is the time that we send the address over to the RAM, and this is the time that we read the data from the RAM. So we can clock it in, and we're done. That's it. So let's call this, where everything is idle, state zero. Now, we're waiting for one of the switches to be pressed. So in this case, if the read switch is pressed, we're going to go to state one, which is going to wait for the read switch to be released. And then in rapid succession, we're going to go to state two, where we're going to enable the address bus and start a load. And then in state three, we're going to clock everything in uh, and then at that point we go straight back to state zero where everything is idle. Now while this is happening of course there are, there are, there are these other signals. So for example the data front panel to bus we definitely want to be always zero. Um, the address up down signal doesn't actually matter and this address to bus signal we also want to be zero because the only thing that should be talking to the address lines is this buffer. That's how you do a read. Now, let's look at something a little more complicated, which is the read with pre-increment. So in this case, uh, we're going to look at the plus plus read switch. We want it to go up and we want it to go down again. Um, again, everything is idle in state zero. We're waiting for a switch press to happen. Um, we're on state four, so let's just call this state four. And then whatever state's going to be next is going to be state five. Okay. So. At this point, um, the first thing that we want to do is 
pre is uh, increment whatever is in the address register. Remember, uh, you have to do a read or a write in order to get the front panel address into the address register in the first place. When you do a plus plus read or a plus plus write, you're not paying attention to the address switches. You're only using whatever is in the address register. All right, so um, we want load, address load, to be zero because we are going to do a, uh, an address up down operation. So we want that to be one um, because if the up down signal is one, you're going to count up. If the up down signal is zero, you're going to count down. Uh, let's see. Uh, we want to also, once we set that up, we want to clock that address in. So there's the address clock. Okay. Um, actually, we're not going to clock anything in. We're, we're just going to clock the um, up down um, operation. Uh, so then the next thing that has to happen at, at that point, uh, it can even happen over here, is that we want to send the address that the register contains over to the address lines of the RAM. So A2 bus at that point is going to go high. Now, yes, uh, the address is going to be the former address at this point, and uh, the address is going to change somewhere during this state, but that doesn't really matter because all we care about is that the address is eventually going to be sent. So 70 nanoseconds later, the RAM is going to read from its data lines, uh, which reminds me, we also have to set output enable to 1 and write enable to 0 in this state. And I may as well write that down here. Output enable one, write enable zero. Uh, data front panel to bus is zero. And address to bus we've already uh, looked at. And address front panel to bus we also turn off. OK, so where are we here? So sometime after that, we want to clock the data into the data register. So this is data clock. And that would be it. So we also want to release the address bus at that point once we're done clocking it, clocking the data in. And the address up down line we can actually release after we've performed the operation. So that's where that goes. All right. So let me draw some more dotted lines here to delineate the states. And we've got state 4, 5, 6, state 7, back to state 0. All right, so that's how you do the two reads. Uh, let's talk about writes. So for writing, again, we're going to wait for the switch to go up and wait for it to come back down. We're up to state 8 right now. So let me stick a dotted line down here. All right. So output enable. Now here, output enable was 1. We can actually set that here and drop it here. OK. Uh, the same thing here. Output enable is 1. We can enable it here and drop it there. All right. Uh, here, output enable is always going to be 0. So we're going to keep it at 0. Uh, let's see. For write, we have the, the address and the data being set up by the switches. So of course, we will want to send those over to the RAM. And because the RAM's output enable is at zero, that means that it is not sending data out. It means that we can send data in. So address front panel to bus and data front panel to bus should both be enabled. So let's do that here. Address front panel to bus and data front panel to bus 
both go high. Um, we also want to clock whatever we have set in the switches into the respective registers. So the address clock, one state later, is going to go high and is going to go low. Same thing with the data clock. It's going to go high and then it's going to go low. And then to write the data in, uh, it's basically the same. We bring it high and then we bring it low and we're done. So let's drop these lines, drop these lines, draw some dotted lines. So we've got states 9, 10, and back to 0. All right, the final thing is the pre-increment write. So this is going to be um, probably, I will put it, let's see, how about here? Oh, um, the address to bus is also zero because we're not sending the address register down to this. Uh, the address up down doesn't actually matter, so we're going to set it to zero. The address load, um, oh, we do have to set the address load, don't we? Uh, the address load needs to be set up here. Okay, otherwise we wouldn't be able to clock anything in. Uh, let's see, data clock, <clears throat> address to mouse, da, da, da. okay, I've got all the signals, great. All right, let's look at the uh, final sequence. All right, so I said state 11, right? State 11, and the next state will be state 12. All right, so in this case, again, we want to increment whatever is in the address first. So we've already done that sort of thing right over here. So let's just copy that. Address load is zero. Address up down is going to go up. And there's going to be one state and then it's going to come back down. The address gets clocked in here or actually the address gets incremented there. And then the address gets sent out over the bus here. Okay, output enable is zero, of course. And once we've done that, let's see, uh, we've also got the data that needs to be clocked in, don't we? So data clock, um, we can clock it in whenever. Just clock it in over there, just for the hell of it. Um, it's the same thing as this. We, we could, in fact, move this data clock over to here if we wanted to because the data is present on the address, on the data lines, on the front panel data lines. Um, so I guess just to be consistent, let's put the pulse here when the address clock goes up. Okay. So we don't actually want to enable write until we have finished the increment operation, which means that write enable goes high at this point and then comes back down. So uh, that should be it. Address load, of course, is zero, and we've already got address up down. So let me just count up the signals to make sure we've taken care of everything. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hmm. What am I missing? What am I missing? Well, here I'm missing the address up down signal, which we want to be zero. Okay, so that's nine signals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I've missed probably uh, these two buses. Um, oh, okay. Well, I've certainly missed the data front panel to bus signal. Data front panel to bus. That has to come, let's see, that has to be set up here. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Excellent. All right. Let's draw some dotted lines. 
uh, the address to bus can be dropped at this point. So we've got state 11, 12, 13, 14, and back down to zero. All right, so I've set that up. Excellent. Uh, so we have 15 states. 15 states are going to take four state bits. We've got nine output signals. And we're going to have one reset input, one reset input, because of course we want to reset the entire state machine on power up or you know whenever, and that will go back to state zero. We have four switches, so we have four switch inputs. So in terms of outputs, we have nine plus four, 13 and in terms of inputs we have 4 plus 5 is 9. Total number is 22 and then of course we have plus the state machine clock. So the unfortunate thing about this is that there are 22 signals plus one state machine clock. Now, if I wanted to use a 22V10 gal to implement this state machine, well, unfortunately, one of those 22 IO lines has to be taken up by the clock, which means that I would have to split this in two. So maybe I could use, you know, two 16V8s possibly. Uh, because we have 13 outputs, so, you know, say eight outputs would be on one uh, and the rest would be on the other. And in terms of inputs, uh, that's actually not going to work because we need all of the inputs in order to determine what state we want to go into next. So we can't use 16 V8s because there would be eight outputs and eight inputs, one of which would be the clock, so that's only seven inputs. So we have to go with two 22 V10s. If we have 13 outputs, we could divide, um, let's see, we could put six on one and five on the other, and that would leave plenty of input, uh, input pin space for the 22 V10s. So that's how it's done. That's how we've designed a state machine to operate this circuitry. Uh, let's just uh, put that into Winkoople and see what happens. Some of you may have been yelling at the screen. This data front panel to bus has to be put onto the bus before we clock the data in. So this actually has to be high up here. And then we release it over there. So slight mistake, but corrected before we actually did anything. Right, so what I've done is I've taken the state machine and just converted it into a spreadsheet. Uh, so I've divided the spreadsheet into two sections. One section is basically how to get from one state to another. So for example, um, obviously when you hit the reset uh, signal, no matter what state you're in, you want to go to state zero. Great. Um, if you press the read switch, uh, and of course none of the other switches are pressed, uh, then and you're in state zero, then you want to go to state one. Uh, if you hit the increment read switch, then you want to go from state zero to state four, and so on. Um, the other thing is that uh, what I don't have explicitly here in the table is that if none of these conditions are true, then you always want to stay in the same state. So, for example, um, after you release the read switch uh, and you're in state one, you go to state two, but of course, as long as you're holding down the read switch, you remain in state one. Now, when you go to state two, at that point, all we're doing is outputting some patterns. 
uh, some logic patterns to control all the buffers and the chips and so on. So it doesn't matter what we're doing, we're going to go from state two to state three on the next clock. Same thing from state three to state zero on the next clock. Of course, as long as reset isn't uh, being asserted. So that's what this uh, first table is. Uh, the second table is what, uh, what the outputs are depending on what the current state is. So for example, uh, in state two, the only signals that are asserted are the AFP to bus, address load, and output enable. Um, all the other signals are by default zero. So that states zero to 14. Okay, now on the right side, um, what I have here is the .pld file. Um, a .pld file is what WinCouple takes. Uh, this is the software that converts your logic equations to a fuse map that can be programmed into the GAL. Um, I have to split the state machine into two GALs. So I have front panel one and front panel two. Uh, both of them are going to be 22 V10s. Uh, so the first section of the PLD file is uh, just a bunch of annotations, name, date, revision, and device. These are standard uh, for the header. Uh, the next section is you get to define what the names of the signals are uh, and uh, what pins they are associated with. So for example, pins 23 down to 20 are the next state, Q3 down to Q0. And uh, this is, if you're looking at a pinout, it's going to be in the upper right hand of the uh, chip. If you're looking at it with pin 1 on the upper left. Uh, pin 1 is always clock. That's just a limitation of the architecture of the chip. Uh, and then you get the input pins. So we've got pin 2 up to 5 are the current state, D3 down to D0. And then we've got 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are the five inputs, the four switches, and the reset button. Uh, so you'll notice that I don't have any of the outputs on this chip. Uh, that's because I put all the outputs on the second GAL. Uh, the purpose of the first GAL is to uh, determine what the next state is based on the um, switch uh, signals uh, and the reset, of course. And the purpose of the second gal is simply combinatorial. So that's just going to uh, output the signals according to the current state. So uh, the next section, um, I am just defining some convenient uh, fields, and fields are just lists of signals that you can handle all at once. So next state is defined as Q3 down to Q0, and current state D3 down to D0. Now, because I'm using the, um, the flip-flop block or the, the macro cell of the gal, um, I have to define what the asynchronous reset uh, for that flip-flop is. So for all of the output signals, I'm defining the asynchronous reset, of course, as the reset signal. Next, I'm defining a bunch of constants. Uh, you probably don't have to do this. I believe that WinCouple accepts possibly uh, decimal values, maybe even hex values. Nevertheless, I just found this convenient. So state zero is defined as binary zero, 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 and so on. So I've defined that for every state. So the next thing is uh, now I'm going to code up uh, state zero. So here are a bunch of intermediate uh, equations. I'll get to those in a moment. Uh, but what I want to show is the append statement. Now what this does is it basically is like or equals. So we're just going to append this statement with any previous statement using an or. Uh, so in other words, next state dot D, D being the input to the flip-flop, will be this or this or this, or this, and so on and so on, down through the rest of the file. And this is uh, a very convenient way of defining a state machine. Now, I'm aware that uh, there is a state machine syntax that WinCouple accepts. I decided not to use it because I just want things to be uh, relatively clear, and I, I feel that this does make things clear. So let's examine the first statement here. 
uh, the colon is basically an equals operator. So here we're comparing the current state with state zero. And condition zero one needs to be true. Now condition zero one here is the read uh, signal is asserted, but none of the other signals are asserted. Condition zero two is the increment read is asserted. Oh, I've got a mistake here. Look at that. Okay. Um, the increment read is asserted, but none of the other signals are asserted. Condition three, of course, is the write signal, and condition four is the increment write signal. Now, because again, you need to specify what happens if none of those conditions are true, I need to define the negative of any of those conditions. So that's what this is. Note that the uh, pound sign is used as or in WinCoogle. So, uh, if you look again at this statement, you can see that we're comparing the current state to state 0 and condition 0, 1 is true. Now, that is a single Boolean value. It's either true or false. But we're ending it with state 1, which is a 4-bit value. What WinCouple knows how to do is to basically broadcast that single Boolean value across this operation. So, it's going to and every bit of state one with the single bit that is the result of this computation. So uh, this is the way that you basically write a state machine. Uh, you define what happens on the next uh, clock cycle by defining the dot D signal. Um, and then because the clock signal by default goes to every single flip-flop, um, that will clock all the flip-flops simultaneously. Uh, so one other thing that I want to show is this silly thing over here. Now, you might say, well, if the asynchronous reset that I've defined up here will clear out all the flip-flops, why do I need to define that uh, state two only goes to state three if reset is not being asserted. And why didn't I put that in any of these other equations? The answer is WinCouple. It's legacy software. It's not that smart, apparently. Um, and it actually had problems with this equation when the not reset and was, uh, was not in there. So just a comparison and uh, a bit pattern apparently caused the software to die in a mysterious way. So this was the only way to fix it. Uh, and as I've said before, and I will continue to say, we really need an open uh, hardware programmer with open source software so that we can solve all of these silly little problems. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the first gal. The second gal uh, is just combinatorial. So here I've defined the output signals. So pins 23 down to pin 15 are all of the output signals. There are nine of them. Now you'll notice that I have output enable and write enable with um, active high uh, as I've defined my state machine. You can define it as an active low output by just putting a bang in front of the um, symbol and uh, the compiler will know to activate the inverter on the output. So that's very convenient. And the reason why we wanted active low is, of course, because the RAMS signal, uh, signals are active low. So we have some inputs. Uh, pins 2 through 5, just like in the first gal, are D3 down to D0. And also, just like in the first gal, pin 10 I've defined as reset, just to be consistent. But that's all we need. Uh, we don't need a clock because this is combinatorial logic. Um, and we don't need to output the next state because, well, that's what gal1 is for. So here are the definitions again, and here are the definitions of the signals. So AFP to bus is simply not reset and any of these states. So if you look at AFP to bus over here, you can see that it's only active during states 2, 3, 9, or 10. 2, 3, 9, or 10. And hopefully I got the rest of it correct. But we'll test that. Anyway, so the next thing to do is to fire up WinCouple and compile these down to a fuse map or a JEDEC file. So let's take a look at that. So here is WinCouple, the Atmel version. Uh, 
Well, it's actually Microchip now because Microchip bought Atmel in 2016. Uh, the only thing that this supports are the Atmel chips, uh, so that's nice. Um, so let's open front panel onepld Okay, so it pulls it up in an editor, and you can edit the uh, you can edit the code here, but um, it's a kind of a silly text editor. I prefer to just edit in my own editor and then reload the file. So let's take a look at some of the options for the compiler. So first of all, it's very important that JEDEC is checked. Um, the JEDEC file is the file that the programmer needs in order to program the chip, that is the fuse map. Um, and JEDEC is the file format. Also, there is a documentation file that uh, WinCouple can output, which is very convenient. It gives you the plot of all the fuses and also the minimized equations which is quite nice to look at. It also gives you a pinout. Um, in terms of minimization, this is how it minimizes the logical equations that you've written. Um, none is really bad. Um, espresso is probably the best. Um, espresso, or actually Espresso, um, I believe that is the actual name of the library. And I think it's a, an open source um, Boolean minimization library. So that's nice. Uh, I don't think we need to pay attention to optimization uh, because that, I think, uh, has to do with maybe some chips that uh, aren't actually supported by Atmel. Uh, that's why keep XOR equations is in there because that used to be uh, some of the old gals and pals that are apparently not compiled into this version. That's nice. Um, general, uh, the JEDEC, the name of the JEDEC file should be the name of the PLD file. Um, so we're going to have front panel 1.jed and front panel 2.jed. Um, I don't think we need any of this, and library is um, something pretty weird, which is undocumented, and who the hell knows what that is. So, um, in terms of devices, you can see that these are all the devices that are supported. That's it. That's all you get. Uh, and in fact, the 20 V8s aren't even being sold anymore. So that's nice. Um, I have a 22 V10C, but in fact, it doesn't really matter because there's this little checkbox down here, device in file. So what it will do is it will look at the device annotation. And because it knows what a G22 V10 is, uh, because if you look at the devices, you can see down here that for the 22V10s, um, you can use a P22V10 or G22V10, uh, and you can do that for any of these. So that's why I've put specifically G22V10 down here in the device. Okay, so all we have to do is compile it. That's this button right here. And we've got five warnings and zero errors. Now the warnings, uh, there are four warnings over here. Uh, it says that there's no expression assigned to Q0.SP. Now SP is the synchronous preset line for all of the flip-flops. There's also an asynchronous reset line, which we've connected up to the reset input. But we haven't set the synchronous preset to anything because there's no reason for us to preset any of the flip-flops. So it's just warning, uh, it's just warning us saying, you know, hey, you might have forgotten to use a synchronous preset. So there it is. Um, what's the fifth warning? Missing header items. It's probably just complaining that um, there may be a missing header over here or a missing annotation. That's actually not important. It's just a warning. As long as it's not an error, we don't really care. Um, okay, that's front panel one. Now, what the compilation did was it output a JEDEC file and also a documentation file. So here's the documentation file. Uh, this is the end of the file. Let's go all the way up to the beginning. And you can see that it's basically copied over some of the annotations. Um, these are the expanded product terms or the minimized equations. Uh, this is actually front panel two. Let me open front panel one. Sorry about that. So front panel. And the interesting thing is that it's in all caps. Why? Legacy software. There we go. 
So these are the expanded product terms. So here's Q0, and of course the asynchronous reset is the reset line. There's Q1, Q2, and so on. Um, this is nice because it shows you how many product terms you used and how many product terms are available for your chosen pin. Different pins have different numbers of product terms available. So this is useful to know uh, because you might say, oh, my product term actually has um, 14, uh, I actually have 14 product terms, but I assign that to pin 21, which can't take 14 product terms. So I'll just assign it to pin 20 instead. So that's nice. Uh, this is the fuse map. And this is the pinout, which is very, very convenient. So you can see exactly which pins are what. So that's front panel one. Let's go ahead and compile front panel two. So I open front panel two. I don't need to set any options. I just hit compile, one warning. What's the warning? A missing header item, that's okay. At least one of the header statements is missing. Well, which one is missing? Thanks for letting me know. Legacy software. So now we're done with that. Um, let's take a look at the result. Front panel two dot doc. And there it is, expanded product terms, the, this thing, fuse plot, and the chip diagram. Uh, it's actually kind of nice to look at the chip diagram to make sure that, you're, that it actually ended up with 24 pins, which is uh, the number of pins in a 22V10 instead of a 16V8, which has, uh, I believe, 18 pins. So that's nice. Uh, let's take a look at the JEDEC file as well. Um, JEDEC is um, a file format that is quite old. So it'll look a little odd, front panel.jed. So basically, oh, great, start of text. Um, Non-printable characters, that's okay. Um, so again, a bunch of headers, uh, and then it's got basically a bunch of commands. This, this tells the programmer how many total fuses there are. Uh, I think the F0 line basically says this is the default value of a fuse if it's not specified. And then you've got a bunch of lines, uh, starting from fuse number zero, what the settings of the fuses are, and so on. Um, and you can, I believe, skip fuses because, yeah, Here's a whole bunch of skips um, because you've defined, or uh, the compiler has defined, uh, the default setting of a fuse. Uh, there's a checksum at the end, and then I think that's a checksum for the entire file. So that's basically what a JEDEC file looks like, and the programmer software should accept that and program our chips, which we're going to do now, program our chips. Now, I bought some Atmel uh, chips, but I'm going to be using these lattice gals. Uh, why? Well, funny story. So I bought this uh, VP598 Wellon programmer, which claims to be able to program the Atmel chips. Well, it turns out that it doesn't. Um, I actually did program one or two chips successfully, but every time after that, uh, it just seemed to uh, not pass checksum, and it, it just didn't work. Um, and it even didn't work sometimes with some of these lattice chips, uh, which is quite surprising. So uh, stay away from this. Um, instead, I'm going to use the Mini Pro programmer, which uh, also does not support the Atmel chips, but at least they say they don't support the Atmel chips. Uh, but they do support these lattice gals, and you can get lattice gals off of eBay. Um, pretty easily. There's, um, I guess, millions of them out there. Um, so let's take a look at the software. So uh, what we're going to do is we are going to select an IC, uh, and specifically it's going to be a PLD or GAL. Um, it's going to be a lattice chip because they, they only support the ATF16V8. Uh, so here's the lattice uh, section, and I have a GAL22V10D. So I'm just going to select that. Um, I do not encrypt anything because I am an open sort of person. That's the way I roll. 
Uh, okay, so the next thing that I need to do is open the JEDEC file. So where are we? Front panel one dot JED. Open. Okay, and you can see that here's the fuse map loaded all the way down to that very last fuse. So now uh, I'm just going to plug the Mini Pro in. Great. Um, click that off again. I don't know why it set that again. Um, and hardware interface, yes, it's TL866. So I am just going to put the gal in like that. And then I'm going to hit what? Program, right? Programming chip, yes. Code memory, lock bit, I have no idea. I don't think I want to lock it. So, yeah, because otherwise I couldn't rewrite it, I guess, without erasing it. I don't know. Anyway, program, erasing, programming, verifying, done. Okay. So that's uh, gal number one. And of course, now I have to remember that that's gal number one. I could put a little label on it. Um, which is probably a good idea, but I'm not going to do that right now. So here is going to be the second gal, so I'm just going to open that. Uh, front panel 2.jed. Okay, and again, it, it tries to encrypt by default. Why? Um, and then we just go ahead and program. Program. Erasing. Programming. Verifying. Done. Okay, that's it. So now I have gals one and two, and I can test that, which we will do now. Test those. Okay, so here I have uh, the circuit hooked up. Uh, I have the two gals hooked up. I've got four LEDs here for the states. Uh, you can see that the next state goes to the current state using these jumpers, and they get transferred over to the combinatorial gal on this side using these jumpers. Um, and I have four LEDs here. I don't have enough LEDs to show all of the signals, but uh, this is just going to be an example. So uh, the first LED here on the left is the um, address register to the bus. So that goes from the counter uh, that stores the address to the bus. Uh, the next one is the address clock. The next one is the address increment signal, or the address up-down signal. And this one over here is the output enable for the chip, for the, uh, for the RAM. So I'm just going to put this little piece of plastic over the LEDs because it makes it easier to see. Um, and this wire is hooked up to the increment read switch. So basically I'm going to simulate the increment read switch using this wire, and this button is the clock. The idea is that the clock is continuously going at like, you know, 2 megahertz or 4 megahertz or whatever it is. I'm just going to press this uh, whenever I need to. So, okay, so first we're at state 0, and now I'm going to simulate pressing the switch um, I can keep uh, clocking the state machine, and of course we're not doing anything because we are waiting for the, um, for the switch to be released. Um, this LED over here is output enable. Um, it's a negative signal, so you can see that it is not asserted. So now I'm going to release the switch, and in the next clock cycle, we're at state 5 and output enable has gone low, which means that we are now enabling read from the RAM, and the address increment has gone high. So the next state is state six. The address to bus has gone high. So we are sending the address that's in the address register over to the RAM. So the address clock went high, which basically says to the register, okay, increment your address. And in the next state, again, 
uh, the address to bus signal is high, so we are still sending the now incremented address over to the RAM. Notice that output enable is still um, enabled. So, and then we're back to zero. Now, again, I don't have any uh, any extra LEDs to show the state of the data clock, but if I had, it would have shown that um, after incrementing the address, um, there's one more cycle where we actually clock the data from the RAM into the data register. And now we're back in state zero and we are just waiting for another switch press. So that actually works pretty well, great. Uh, now we have to breadboard the entire circuit. So let's do that. All right, so here I've breadboarded um, eight bits out of the 16. I don't really need to um, have more than eight bits just for testing. Uh, this circuit will work for any number of bits. Okay, so here's the display for the address and here's the display for the data. So I've put LEDs on several of the signals. Um, I have LEDs on the buffer um, signals and I also have LEDs on output enable and write enable on the RAM and the reason that I've done this is because I want to make sure that on power up when we are at state zero all of these LEDs are off and by the way I should mention that when I looked at the data sheets for the buffers um, I realized that the output enable for the buffers are active low so I quickly went into the uh, PLD file and uh, basically I just negated those signals uh, and reprogrammed the gal and I was good to go. So anyway, uh, I've connected these LEDs actually backwards. So um, when they are off, that means that the output enable is unasserted. So I want to make sure that all of these LEDs are off. We're not writing to the chip, we're not outputting from the chip, and all of the buffers are off. Uh, if one of these is on, I guess that's okay, but if two of them are on, that means that two buffers are fighting for the same bus, and that's really bad, and then I will quickly turn off the circuit. So let's go ahead and turn on my power supply and make sure that all of these LEDs are off. Yep. Okay, all of the LEDs are off. That's great. Um, I can clock the state machine and nothing happens. Um, the odd thing though is that the displays are off also. And the reason for that is that I actually forgot to connect the power signals between the, uh, the state machine breadboard and these breadboards. So let's do that right now. Uh, so I'm just going to take uh, two jumpers and I'm going to connect the positive to the positive and the negative to the negative. And now I have to do my test all over again. So power supply on, excellent. All right, so here's the, um, so this is the address and this is the data, uh, the data is the address and the data should basically be random, except for the top eight bits, which I've hard-coded to zero. Um, I don't have any address or data switches going into here, so uh, this is where the data lines would go in from the front panel, and this is where the address lines would go in from the front panel. Uh, I don't really know what they would be set to if they're just left unconnected, so um, I'm just going to do a read and see what happens. So I'm going to clock once, okay, nothing happened because of course we're waiting for the switch to be released. Okay, so here we have the output enable goes uh, asserted for the RAM and also uh, this buffer which, which is the address um, uh, lines from the front panel goes to the RAM. So in theory, we're outputting some address over to the RAM. I guess it's gonna be zero. So I'm gonna clock this in again. Okay, so it's actually FF. And then I'm going to clock again. Okay, and these lines went low and presumably I've clocked something into the data. And that's that. Okay, uh, that was interesting. 
um, let us change one of the address lines to a zero to make sure that we are actually properly clocking in the address. So I'm just going to randomly change one of the addresses to zero. And I'm going to press the read switch. Okay, and now we are sending the address over to the bus, which is the RAM, and also the uh, register, and also we are outputting the data. And if I clock it once again, we should latch the data and the address in. Okay, so there we go, FB, and apparently at that address is 32. And that's it. So reading actually seems to work, which is quite nice. Let's try writing. So let's see, we've got 32 here um, when we're reading from address FB. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the high bit, which I believe is, or maybe it's the low bit. Well, either the high or the low bit, I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, I'm going to change that to a one. And now we're going to try to write. So now very delicately, I have to try to change my switch jumper over to the right signal and then make the read signal always low. I don't want to disturb any of these delicate wires here. Okay. So let's see if we can write. So writing will result in the address and the data buffers going high. This, um, the uh, address register should never be going onto the bus. So let's see what happens. Okay, release the switch. Okay, great. So the address and data buffers are now high, meaning that they're both being, the address and the data are now being sent to the RAM. Um, now I press again. Okay, so we've clocked apparently FF in there. And that's it. Okay, so apparently we've written FF into the memory. Okay, because none of the address, none of the data lines were actually set. Um, now let's go ahead and read. I really need another jumper. Do I have another jumper here? Not conveniently close. Uh, that's unfortunate. Okay, well, here, maybe I'll use this long wire here. Or maybe this big green wire. Okay, that's my read switch. Okay, so I'm going to press the read switch now and I should be reading back FF instead of 3.2, if write actually worked. Okay, release the switch. Okay, we're sending the address over to the RAM. We're outputting from the RAM. Okay, I think that is correct. So let's see what happens when I increment read, when I do an increment read. So we should see the address go up, and whatever is in the RAM will be displayed. So let me get an increment read jumper. Okay, press the switch. Release the switch. Okay, we're outputting. Aha, uh -huh. we just went from FB to FC and we're outputting whatever is in the register over to the bus. That's good. And apparently at that address was 0A. Done. Uh, let's just do it again for fun, because that was actually quite fun. Okay, FD, and there was an F0 for whatever reason at that address. Excellent. Now we are going to write to the data, uh, to the to the RAM using increment write. So I'm going to get one final jumper. This is the last jumper. 
the last switch. So increment right means that we're going to take whatever is here and what I'm going to do is because I know that we're going to be writing an FF I'm going to change one of the lines to a zero. So I think that's either going to be 7F or FE, one of those, depending on whether I got the high bit or the low bit. Uh, okay, so, uh, and FD, so the first thing that should happen is this should go to FE. Then we're going to write that to the data, to the, to the RAM. Okay, so I press the switch. Okay, now this is interesting. Uh, this I don't think should have happened. Um, it looks like the data bus, the, the data lines have been put onto the data bus. I have not yet released the switch. So that's not great. I will have to look at that. Um, so now let me release the switch. Okay, we went to FE. We wrote an FE. And we're going to, uh, well, we, we latched an FE from the front panel. We're writing to the RAM. And now we're done. So now, if I, let's see, which one is the read switch? This one is the read switch. If I read, nothing should change. Oh, well, okay, so for some reason I got an FA and a 3.9 here. That shouldn't have happened. Okay, let me do another read. Okay. Um, oh, that's right, of course. Well, hmm. Okay, so the reason probably that the address... Um, changed is that we're actually reading from the front panel when I did that. And the front panel switches are basically not connected, so I could get zeros and I could get ones. So, well, all right. In any case, I'm pretty sure that everything worked. Uh, the only question, of course, is the increment right. So let me do that once again. Right, that should not happen. It should wait until I release the switch. Okay, so this went to FB, which is correct. We are writing an FE, and that works pretty well. Okay, so everything is actually working with the exception of this one thing over here. Um, that's not critical, but I want to fix that, and I will do that in a moment. All right, so I went ahead and changed the equations. What actually happened was there was a bug in GAL1 where when I pressed the increment right switch, it would go to state 12 instead of state 11. In other words, it wasn't waiting for the switch to be released. So I fixed that in the file and I ran it through WinCouple and WinCouple started giving me these mysterious program errors. Um, it turns out that when I changed the optimization method from Espresso to McCluskey Quine, those errors went away. So I suspect that maybe they're using an older version of the Espresso library that had a bug in it or something. Um, in any case, uh, when I changed the optimization method, um, the program compiled properly. I reprogrammed the gal and stuck it in. And now let us test that final thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an increment right, and this time when I press the button, you can see that the buffer is not enabled, and it will wait until the switch is released. Increment, right, done. Okay, and that's the RAM circuit. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, this was a very, very long um, video, but there was a lot of information to go through, and I hope maybe you learned something, possibly. Um, there is one other thing, which is uh, test vectors. You can actually put test vectors into a JEDEC file, um, and what that will do is basically do what I did in hardware, except in software. Um, 
well, okay, not necessarily in software, but when the gal is in the programmer, after it's programmed, it will be stimulated with your stimulus vectors and then um, read back to make sure that it, um, it reads uh, whatever you were supposed to output. So that is actually a very convenient thing, and I might have done that, and that may have saved me a little bit of effort. Um, but that's just something you should know, that test vectors for JEDEC files do exist. Uh, I guess that's it. So I will hopefully see you on the next video.